This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Brown. The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. Part 1st, Section 12. Though it is not a direct article of the Christian system, that this world that we inhabit is the whole of the habitable creation, yet it is so worked up therewith, from what is called the Mosaic account of the creation, the story of Eve and the apple, and the counterpart of that story, the death of the Son of God, that to believe otherwise, that is, to believe that God created a plurality of worlds, at least as numerous as what we call stars, renders the Christian system of faith at once little and ridiculous, and scatters it in the mind like feathers in the air. The two beliefs cannot be held together in the same mind, and he who thinks that he believes both has thought but little of either. Though the belief of a plurality of worlds was familiar to the ancients, it only within the last three centuries that the extent and dimensions of this globe that we inhabit have been ascertained. Several vessels, following the tract of the ocean, have sailed entirely round the world, as a man may march in a circle, and come round by the contrary side of the circle to the spot he set out from. The circular dimensions of our world, in the widest part, as a man would measure the widest round of an apple or ball, is only 25,020 English miles, reckoning 69 miles and a half to an equatorial degree, and may be sailed round in the space of about three years. Footnote. Allowing a ship to sail, on an average, three miles in an hour, she would sail entirely round the world in less than one year, if she could sail in a direct circle, but she is obliged to follow the course of the ocean. End of footnote. A world of this extent may, at first thought, appear to us to be great, but if we compare it with the immensity of space in which it is suspended, like a bubble or a balloon in the air, it is infinitely less in proportion than the smallest grain of sand is to the size of the world, or the finest particle of dew to the whole ocean, and is therefore but small, and, as will be hereafter shown, is only one of a system of worlds in which the universal creation is composed. It is not difficult to gain some faint idea of the immensity of space in which this and all other worlds are suspended, if we follow a progression of ideas. When we think of the size or dimensions of a room, our ideas limit themselves to the walls, and there they stop. But when our eye or our imagination darts into space, that is, when it looks upward into what we call the open air, we cannot conceive any walls or boundaries it can have. And if for the sake of resting our ideas, we suppose a boundary, the question immediately renews itself and asks, what is beyond that boundary? And in the same manner, what is beyond the next boundary? And so on till the fatigued imagination returns and says, there is no end. Certainly, then, the Creator was not pent for room when he made this world no larger than it is, and we have to seek the reason in something else. If we take a survey of our own world, or rather of this, of which the Creator has given us the use as our portion in the immense system of creation, we find every part of it, the earth, the waters, and the air that surrounds it, filled and, as it were, crowded with life, down from the largest animals that we know of to the smallest insects the naked eye can behold, and from thence to others still smaller and totally invisible without the assistance of the microscope. Every tree, every plant, every leaf serves not only as a habitation 
but as a world to some numerous race, till animal existence becomes so exceedingly refined that the effluvia of a blade of grass would be food for thousands. Since, then, no part of our earth is left unoccupied, why is it to be supposed that the immensity of space is a naked void lying in eternal waste? There is room for millions of worlds as large or larger than ours, and each of them millions of miles apart from each other. Having now arrived at this point, if we carry our ideas only one thought further, we shall see, perhaps, the true reason, at least a very good reason for our happiness, why the Creator, instead of making one immense world extending over an immense quantity of space, has preferred dividing that quantity of matter into several distinct and separate worlds, which we call planets, of which our Earth is one. But before I explain my ideas upon this subject, it is necessary, not for the sake of those who already know, but for those who do not, to show what the system of the universe is. That part of the universe that is called the solar system, meaning the system of worlds to which our Earth belongs, and of which soul, or in English language, the sun, is the center, consists besides the sun of six distinct orbs or planets or worlds, besides the secondary called the satellites or moons of which our earth has one that attends her in her annual revolution around the sun, in like manner as the other satellites or moons attend the planets or worlds to which they severally belong, as may be seen by the assistance of the telescope. The sun is the center round which those six worlds or planets revolve at different distances therefrom, and in circles concentrate to each other. Each world keeps constantly in nearly the same track round the sun, and continues at the same time turning round itself in nearly an upright position, as a top turns round itself when it is spinning on the ground and leans a little sideways. It is this leaning of the earth, 23.5 degrees, that occasions summer and winter, and the different length of days and nights. If the earth turned round itself in a position perpendicular to the plane, or level of the circle it moves in around the sun, as a top turns round when it stands erect on the ground, the days and nights would be always of the same length, 12 hours day and 12 hours night, and the seasons would be uniformly the same throughout the year. Every time that a planet, our Earth for example, turns round itself, it makes what we call day and night, and every time it goes entirely round the sun, it makes what we call a year. Consequently, our world turns 365 times round itself in going once round the sun. Footnote. Those who supposed that the sun went round the earth every 24 hours made the same mistake in idea that a cook would do in fact that should make the fire go round the meat instead of the meat turning round itself toward the fire. End of footnote. The names that the ancients gave to those six worlds, in which are still called by the same names, are Mercury, Venus, this world that we call ours, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They appear larger to the eye than the stars, being many million miles nearer to our Earth than any of the stars are. The planet Venus is that which is called the evening star and sometimes the morning star, as she happens to set after or rise before the sun, in which either case is never more than three hours. The sun, as before said, being the center, the planet or world nearest the sun is Mercury. His distance from the sun is 34 million miles, and he moves round in a circle, always at that distance from the sun. 
as a top may be supposed to spin round in the track in which a horse goes in a mill. The second world is Venus. She is 57 million miles distant from the sun, and consequently moves round in a circle much greater than that of Mercury. The third world is this that we inhabit, and which is 88 million miles distant from the sun and consequently moves round in a circle greater than that of Venus. The fourth world is Mars. He is distant from the Sun 134 million miles, and consequently moves round in a circle greater than that of our Earth. The fifth is Jupiter. He is distant from the Sun 557 million miles, and consequently moves round in a circle greater than that of Mars. The sixth world is Saturn. He is distant from the sun 763 million miles and consequently moves round in a circle that surrounds the circles or orbits of all the other worlds or planets. The space, therefore, in the air or in the immensity of space that our solar system takes up for the several worlds to perform their revolutions in round the sun is of the extent in a straight line of the whole diameter of the orbit or circle in which Saturn moves round the Sun, which being double his distance from the Sun, is 1,526 million miles, and its circular extent is nearly 5,000 million, and its globular contents is almost 3,500 million, times 3,500 million square miles. Footnote. If it should be asked, how can man know these things? I have one plain answer to give, which is that man knows how to calculate an eclipse, and also how to calculate to a minute of time when the planet Venus, in making her revolutions around the sun, will come in a straight line between our Earth and the Sun, and will appear to us about the size of a large pea passing across the face of the Sun. This happens but twice in about a hundred years, at the distance of about eight years from each other, and has happened twice in our time, both of which were foreknown by calculation. It can also be known when they will happen again for a thousand years to come, or to any other portion of time. As, therefore, man could not be able to do these things if he did not understand the solar system and the manner in which the revolutions of the several planets or worlds are performed, the fact of calculating an eclipse or a transit of Venus is a proof in point that the knowledge exists and as to a few thousand or even a few million miles, more or less, it makes scarcely any sensible difference in such immense distances. End of footnote. End of part 12.